nobody here can take me in for anything that I didn't do. I know Hogan's still under contract. I want Hogan tonight. Call it a warm-up. I owe my fans one last retirement match. Very tentative look on Hogan's face, but Nash ready to go at it. You don't deserve the right to be the number one contender. I want a title shot tonight. What? He's oh, gonna put some butts in the seat. <laughs> you want a war? You're gonna get one. Now get the gun! The drugs! The my generation will take the fall! The saints will cross the nation's head! The one you've all been waiting for, the 4th of January 1999. Welcome to Reliving the War and welcome to a new year. Tonight rolls a tape show from Worcester Mass while WCW Nitro comes live from the Georgia Dome in Atlanta. Many consider tonight's shows pivotal not only in the Monday Night War but for pro wrestling as a whole. It's one of the most talked about nights in wrestling history and we're going to watch both shows from start to end and see exactly what went on. So grab your supplies right now soldier because this is the point of no return. We we have the first ever father and daughter jam up guys this week on Reliving the War and this made me smile from ear to ear. This is Philip and Lillian all the way from Tennessee. Philip has two daughters who became wrestling fans through Reliving the War. His youngest prefers Raw while Lillian here of course prefers Nitro. Lillian's shirt is an absolute winner. Great stuff. Thank you very much guys and I hope this week's episode doesn't cause any arguments at the dinner table. Okay, I think I'm mentally prepared for this. Let's do it. Episode 167 of Reliving the War. Mike Tenay says that WCW's return home as balloons fall from the Georgia Dome ceiling. The atmosphere over on Nitro's electric tonight. How do you keep this electricity flowing and how do you keep the fans all pumped up? By putting on a Glacier vs Hugh Morris match to kick off the in-ring action. Raw wins reliving the war this week, thank you very much for watching and please take care. It feels like the only reason this match is happening is so Jimmy Hart can walk the aisle in the Georgia Dome but anyway, the commentary team are delighted to have a new boss after what happened last week and they say that we're gonna hear from Ric Flair in just a moment. We're also gonna hear from Hollywood Hogan who's in the Georgia Dome tonight for Nitro. As bootleg Sub-Zero gets the better of Morris in the ring with some basic punches and kicks, Tony Schiavone also reminds us that Kevin Nash defends his world title tonight against Bill Goldberg in the main event. Morris finally gets into the match with a power slam but Glacier is quick to take control again. Frosty Balls lines up a cryonic kick, Jimmy Hart gets on the apron, Morris accidentally nails his manager but it really had no effect on the match outcome. Glacier gets turned inside out with a big clothesline and Morris defeats two Cold Dars Holio with his no laughing matter moonsault. The new president of WCW arrives with a horseman and his children, Reed, David and Ashley are here. Ashley, of course, is better known nowadays as Charlotte Flair. Dean Malenko's on crutches, Mike Tanay says he has a sprained ankle after a house show match last night. He's still here for Flair's inaugural speech as WCW president though, and Flair says this is a very proud moment for the nature boy. Rick says he's been asked by a lot of people what he's gonna do with Eric Bischoff now that Slick Rick's in command. So Flair Eric calls Eric down to the ring to talk to Easy e face to face. Eric steps in the ring and the president reminds Eric that Bischoff took pleasure in making the nature boy feel very small on many occasions. Eric embarrassed Flair in front of his peers and the easy thing to do right now would be to fire Eric and send him back into another company. But no, that would be too easy. So from this point on, Eric Bischoff works for Tony Schiavone. Eric's gonna provide commentary while also getting his salary cut in half, seeing as he won't be visible on TV anymore. Eric wants to argue this, but he ends up doing what he's told. 
We then get reminded of the time that Eric Bischoff fired Randy Anderson, highlighting how much of a tarrant Easy e really was. So Rick brings Randy out and he doubles his salary. Good guy Flair's making things right it seems. Rick then thanks everyone who came out last week to celebrate with him and he also thanks Randy Savage, a man who Rick's never seen eye to eye with. Flair welcomes Savage back to WCW with open arms, but unfortunately we won't be seeing Randy again for quite some time. The Nature Boy then books himself in a match for Sold Out, a two on one match, Flair vs Kurt Hennig and Barry Windham. Why this lunatic would do such a thing is beyond me, but anyway, David Flair says he wants to team up with his dad for this pay per view match and Rick's like, haha, get a load of this little twerp. But Arn Anderson says David knows what he's doing and David's ready. So Rick agrees and we've now got a tag match it's sold out. I don't know man, all joking aside, David Flair looked like a nervous wreck in that ring, but let's give it a chance and let's pretend we don't know what happens moving forward. It's the least we can do at this point. Emery Hill gets another shot at the big time, he tries his luck against Booker T and he only lasted for a minute. Nitro's ran for 32 minutes so far and we've had 3.5 minutes of in-ring action. Eric Bischoff did not talk at all during the match. As a matter of fact, his boss Tony Schiavone said he might have to put in a complaint tomorrow during a meeting with Ric Flair. a Norman Smiley vs Chavo Guerrero rematch. Their match last week was so entertaining. Norman takes a clothesline and he gets drop kicked out of the ring early on, giving Chavo a chance to ride Pepe around for a bit. Norman replies with his signature front and back slap before shaking his stuff, and Pepe watches on as Norman performs the Smiley Slam. Chavo takes a full and par slam courtesy of your favourite wrestler, but Norman's unsuccessful when going for a submission. Smiley's knee strike attempt also gets countered with a pin attempt, and Chavo's reversal skills are on top form tonight as he also prevents Norman from performing a German suplex. Norman drop kicks Chavo out of the ring, he wiggles his ass off but he doesn't notice Chavo climbing the turnbuckles. Smiley takes a missile drop kick, he tries to shake it off and go on offense, but he's been rocked pretty hard as evidence when he tries to do the big wiggle. Chavo however has no issues giving fans the little wiggle. It was all going so well, actually it was going better than well, but then Chavo has two back to back slip ups that the commentators just couldn't ignore. Still, Chavo manages to win the match when he counters the Norman Conquest with a sunset flip. Chavo celebrates with Pepe and Norman isn't having it at all. He attacks Chavo after the bell with a vertical suplex and the smiley slam before leaving the ring. So it looks like we have a rivalry on our hands here and I'm here for it. Chris Benoit then took on Horace Hogan. One of the highlights of the match was this dive through the middle ropes from Horace, but unfortunately Mr. Hogan was unable to overcome the multiple suplexes, the diving headbutt and the crippler crossface. A pretty standard Benoit match right here, you know what to expect. We then go outside where Bill Goldberg is getting arrested, yeah, we have no idea why he's getting arrested and neither does Goldberg, but Billy Boy says he did nothing wrong, that's what they all say. Goldberg says this could ruin his reputation, he's done a lot for the community here in Atlanta and these dirty coppers should know better, but police chief Jack tells Goldberg to chill out. Goldberg has to go down to the precinct to get this all sorted out, everything's gonna be fine and Bill can go back to doing whatever it is that Bill Goldberg does. Goldberg says this is wrong, he's all pissed off, but he's going to get interviewed downtown and this means our title match tonight is probably in jeopardy. Kevin Nash, the world champion, sees Goldberg getting put in a police car, he's not happy about it at all, and as the car speeds off we see Hulk Hogan walking into the Georgia Dome. Hogan says a man should do his time if he's guilty while laughing at Kevin, and as Hogan makes his way into the dome we see Miss Elizabeth getting questioned by detectives. We have a mystery on our hands tonight on Monday Nitro. Raw begins with a Vince McMahon promo, on Nitro it's Saturn vs Chris Jericho. Raw opened up with a tribute video to Shawn Michaels, a tribute video that Vince McMahon cut short before heading to the ring. Vince says Shawn threatened to show up tonight on Raw but the fans shouldn't hold their breath. You're then quickly drawn to Kane right here who has a sign on his back, it looks like the Stooges are advertising the Briscoe body shop on the big red machine. 
<laughs> McMahon says he did what he had to do last week, he made an example out of HBK, but the fans then make a lot of noise when they see Sean on the Titan Tron. HBK is here and he's gonna come out to talk with Mr. McMahon. Sean says the sheriff's back in town and he's also brought a few friends along with him. The DX song plays in the arena, the crowd pops again, and it looks like HBK is once again part of D-Generation X. Gotta say, this makes no sense at all after what Sean did and what Sean said about his old faction. Anyway, Sean says his overpriced lawyers confirmed that his WWF contract is ironclad. He's still actually the commissioner. It was McMahon who said on national TV that the new commissioner wouldn't have to answer to the chairman, so Sean Michaels is still in control. The only way Sean loses his job, apparently, is if the heartbreak kid resigns, and that means McMahon's gonna be singing the tune of Sweet Chin music for a very long time. Sean says he wants to make all of Vince's dreams come true. He plays footage from a few weeks back on the Titantron where Vince said he hopes to draw number 2 in the Royal Rumble, but of course he drew number 30. Well, seeing as the commissioner has say so over all WWF competitors except for Stone Cold, and seeing as Vince is a competitor in the Royal Rumble match, Sean makes the decision to move Vince into the number 2 spot. Vince has no choice, he will have to go face to face with Austin at the Royal Rumble pay per view. Sean also says that at some point during the evening he's gonna give a surprise to Mr. McMahon, and that surprise is gonna drive Vince stone cold crazy. Over on Nitro, things don't start too well for Chris Jericho at all. He gets slapped in the face, he takes a clothesline, he then takes an overhead belly to belly suplex, and Saturn lays the boots in after throwing Chris into the corner. The Paragon of Virtue finally gets a chance to fight back after hitting his springboard dropkick, and just before we take a commercial break, Saturn gets suplexed on the floor. We come back and Giovanni asks Bischoff if he knows why Goldberg got arrested, but Eric continues to stay silent. Jericho performs a vertical suplex, he misses a heel kick, Saturn goes up for the DVD, and when Chris escapes, Saturn instead opts for an exploder suplex. The match ends with Jericho slapping the referee in the face, he then pulls Scott Dickinson in front of him and Saturn takes the referee out, and when the referee wakes up, he calls for a DQ. He doesn't disqualify Chris, he disqualifies Saturn, so the issues between Scott Dickinson and Saturn continue in WCW, what a rivalry. We learn later that Jericho put Scott up to this, Chris told Scott the easiest way to get revenge on Saturn was to use the rules to his advantage. Bill Goldberg gets questioned next on Nitro, while over on Raw it's Steve Blackman vs Ken Shamrock. An old rivalry reignites on Raw, Blackman said he had reopened the dojo if Dan Severn and Shamrock would join up once again, but Shamrock rules with the corporation now and he took offence to Steve's kind offer. So here we are, back in the ring to settle things like real men. Shamrock stays on his feet following a back elbow, but a spin kick puts the IC and tag champ on the mat. The match could have ended right here with the most electrifying move in sports entertainment today, the Mervug elbow, but Big Stevie Cool wants to make him pay for choosing the corporation over the dojo. Shamrock tries to fight back, Blackman's like, not today pal. Kenny Boy tries one more time with a power slam, but oh my god, look, it's Dan Severn. It's time to find out if he's dojo for life. Sir Steve Blackman takes a suplex and Ken then looks over at Dan Severn after hitting a knee drop. This is so tense right now. Ken gives Severn a thumbs up, so that confirms it. Severn and Shamrock are starting their own dojo, the Beastie Boys School of Ass Booters. Now knowing what needs to be done, Blackman throws Ken into the corner before drop kicking Ken's back. Shamrock gets his neck snapped over the top rope, but the world's most dangerous man comes back with a belly to belly. Severn tells Shamrock it's time to go, Blackman's had enough. Shamrock's just about to grab his bags, but no, it's a swerve. BA Billy Gunn shows up and he hits Shamrock with a famouser. Blackman covers Ken, and Blackman wins the match. Dan Severn and Shamrock are not starting the Beastie Boys School of Ass Booters. Severn is with Blackman once again, but they now have an angry IC champion to deal with, and the new dojo is gonna need reinforcements. Billy Gunn and Ken Shamrock fight backstage after the match. No one gets the better of the other, and the brawl gets broken up by officials. 
On Nitro, Billy Boy gets brought to the cop shop. He's brought into room 3, also known as the Romper Room, and Bill learns he's being arrested for aggravated stalking. Bill Goldberg's been on the prowl, it seems. You want to know who's responsible for this? Miss Elizabeth. That's right. Liz said Goldberg stalked her, and Goldberg says, No, no way. This dirty copper should know that Goldberg isn't capable of such a crime. But the boys have to do their job, and Goldberg's gonna have to sit there like the dirty pervert he really is. Meanwhile, Liz is getting interviewed by Detective Casey Closed. Liz says Goldberg last confronted her at the water cooler just as Mr. Peacock enters the room, first name Drew. Liz says she's filed three reports already, Goldberg follows her everywhere, at Nitro last week, at Starcade, at hotels, at the gym. Bill stalks Liz and the only question Mr. Peacock has after Liz explains all this is, did you feel threatened? No Drew, she felt like this was absolutely normal fucking behaviour. Drew wants to talk with Casey in private, so the investigation continues on. Mankind cuts a promo next on Raw. On Nitro, Kidman and Rey Mysterio take on Juventud Guerrera in Psychosis. Foley says last week was the first time he ever said the words suck it without saying the word please in front of them. And he also found out last week that he really enjoys kicking the McMahon's asses. Mick says he wants a title shot at the Royal Rumble, he thinks he deserves as much and not because he's beating up Shane Vince and the corporate stooges over these past few weeks, but because fans are bringing signs that say Foley is God. Foley doesn't think he's God, but he thinks he's pretty good. And hey, he also beat the corporate champion at rock bottom. So Mankind wants Dad to come out and give him what he wants. Vince calls Mankind a delusioned monster. Mankind being connected with the WWF title would stay in the World Wrestling Federation as a whole, so Vince isn't going to grant Mankind his wish. Vince reminds Mick that he had opportunities in the past, Foley didn't listen to McMahon and he blew it. Mick listens to these fans too much, he puts his body through agony just to get approval from these fans, and Vince thinks that the way Mick does this is absolutely pathetic. When Mankind put his slimy hands on my son Shane, he soiled the good McMahon name. So no, Mankind doesn't deserve to be number one contender, he hasn't paid his dues, but McMahon will give Mick one more opportunity. He can earn the right to take part in the 1999 Royal Rumble match if he can beat Triple H tonight on Raw. Whoever wins is gonna enter the Rumble match, so we're gonna see that one a little later on. There will be a guest referee for this match though, and that referee is Shane McMahon. The odds are stacked against poor Mick Foley once again. Before the Nitro tag match takes place, we're treated to a video showing the LWO having a house party, the highlight of which was Eddie Guerrero looking at Jam Master El Dandy's cards during a poker game. Eddie was a little bossy to Psychosis, Dandy and Hector Garza, and it looks like these three were discussing Eddie's behaviour as of late, but Latino Heat didn't seem to mind as the party went on all night long. Eddie and the LW are heroes right here, but back in the Georgia Dome, the fans go crazy for Kidman and Ray, who, if you remember, are having some issues of their own following their match last week against Eddie and Hoovy. Psychosis and Kidman start us off, and it's Kidman who comes up short following the usual series of quick counters and reversals that we have become accustomed to in these cruiserweight matches. Psychosis wants to tag out, but it looks like Hoovy doesn't want to get involved in the match. What's this guy's problem? Psychosis ends up forcing his partner to get in, and this all leads to Kidman hitting a few dropkicks on Juventud. Ray tags in, he hits a glorious flying head scissor takedown, and Ray then sends Juventud Guerrera into Kidman for a BK bomb. All this spicy hot action while the commentators wonder if they've ever seen Goldberg and Miss Elizabeth in the same room together. Hoovy gets sent out of the ring, but Ray gets attacked by Psychosis, allowing Guerrera to come back in with a springboard dropkick. The LWO then try to work together, but Ray's able to stop a double team effort with a tilt world backbreaker to Hoovy, but Psychosis stops Ray from tagging out with a dropkick to the head. Eventually, Ray does get that tag, Kidman comes in with his slingshot head scissors, and look at this, a snapmare and head scissor takedown at the same time from the cruiserweight champ. The babyfaces then perform diving crossbodies to the outside and the hits keep coming with a springboard doomsday device. Psychosis took this like a chomp. But things take a bad turn when Kidman inadvertently dropkicks Ray from the top rope. That's two weeks in a row this kind of thing's happened and once again the LWO take advantage and they get the pinfall victory. Things aren't looking so good for this illustrious tag team of Rey Mysterio and Billy Kidman. 
back at the precinct, Goldberg's losing it. Dirty Copper tells Goldberg that Liz said he stalks her at the gym, and Goldberg says, yeah, he's always there because he owns the gym in question. Goldberg wants to leave, the boys say, not today, Buster, so Billy Boy has to wait a little longer before getting back to the Georgia Dome. Mark Henry takes on Goldust next on Raw, over on Nitro, Kevin Nash wants some interview time. China's brought one of her friends to Raw tonight, this lady was also on Sunday Night Heat by the way. The two watch on as Mark Henry vs Goldust gets off to a sloppy start but things get heated up a little when Goldust performs a spinebuster on the world's strongest man and Mark replies with a power slam. Goldust then gets put on the mat again and Mark follows this up with a big elbow drop and after Mark shows off his strength by throwing Goldust high up into the air we see that China and her new best mate are standing at the entranceway. Mark notices these two and he gets distracted, Goldust drills Henry's head into the mat, and Mark's now in big trouble as Dustin points to the corner for some shattered dreams. China watches on as her man gets kicked in the dick and the referee disqualifies Goldust, Mark Henry wins on Raw. China and her unnamed friend comes to the ring and China says she hopes Mark isn't hurt too much because he really needs to hear this. China then says she had an incredible night with Mark not too long ago but maybe she's not enough woman for the world's strongest man. One woman just isn't enough for sexual chocolate apparently. So China introduces Mark and the world to Sammy. China has a proposition for Mark, Sammy and China will help the big man take a load off his mind and this proposition makes Mark faint in the middle of the ring. Mark then wakes up, he realizes what he's in for, so he leaves the ring with Sammy and China to swing some dong and get it on. Mark's an absolute animal. He's an animal! An animal! An animal! We then cut over to this very unsettling footage right here. That looks like Dennis Knight, and it also looks like the Acolytes did way more than just kidnap the hog farmer last week on Raw. Over on Nitro, Kevin Nash says a lot of people say Big Sexy beat Goldberg at Starcade, but as far as Nash is concerned, Bill Goldberg got screwed. Nash has watched everything that's went down tonight so far and he says it doesn't take Inspector Clouseau to work out who's behind all this, it has to be Hulk Hogan. If only Detective Casey Close and Mr. Drew Peacock knew this information too. Since Ric Flair's riding all the wrongs tonight, Kevin wants to fight Hogan. Hogan's still under contract so Nash wants a match against the Hulkster and afterwards Big Sexy will still defend his championship against Goldberg. Ric Flair then appears, he shakes Kevin Nash's hand and Flair says he may disagree with how Nash won the belt but he is the world champion. Flair knows if Liz is involved in all this then obviously Hogan's pulling the strings. Hogan won't show up to Nitro and make a mockery of WCW before taking himself off to Hollywood again. So Flair says yes, Hogan and Nash will wrestle tonight for the world belt but only if Goldberg doesn't make it back to the arena. Mr. Peacock meanwhile is giving Liz a hard time. He wants her to repeat her story once again and this is making Liz a little anxious. Detective Closed reappears and the constant questions make Liz even more defensive and nervous. She raises her voice when saying she's the victim in all this just before Closed and Peacock leave the room again. So Liz is either having short term memory loss or she's making the whole thing up. The Godfather takes on Tess next on Raw, over on Nitro it's Hollywood Hogan's turn to get interviewed. Godfather's got his pimpin' ain't easy catchphrase over big time and every week he comes out he's getting more and more cheers from the audience, good for him. Test attacks early on but the rookie's quickly put in his place with a stiff kick that you could hear in the cheap seats followed by a jumping clothesline. Test then takes a big leg drop before getting set up in the corner and Godfather performs the choo choo train. Yes, the choo choo train according to Michael Cole, the move still hasn't gotten its proper name. Val Venus appears on the rampway as the match spills to the outside and hey hey it's another DQ on Raw. This time it's because the Godfather got thrown into the ring post, seriously. The WWF's officials are either way too strict or way too lenient, there doesn't seem to be any middle ground. It's a bad finish too because both the Godfather and Test could do with getting some clean wins under their belt but yeah there you have it. Venus runs down to attack Test, officials break it up. I think I prefer the Scott Dickinson and Saturn rivalry to be honest but what do I know. Backstage we see Shawn Michaels hanging out with his DX buddies. All has been forgiven it seems and we've got a bunch of United Degenerates back on Raw. So over on Nitro, the man himself says it's clear the world of wrestling still revolves around Hollywood Hogan. 
The hoaxer was going to take the high road and formally say goodbye tonight while also announcing his vice presidential running mate for the upcoming election, but now Hogan's dealing with negative momentum and that's something the next president of the United States just can't have. Hogan calls Goldberg a sexual deviant, he watched that pesky perv get escorted out of the building and it made the hoaxer sick to his stomach. But what's just as bad is that big tall spoon Kevin Nash starting rumours. Yes, he called him a spoon. Mean Gene reminds Hulk that Ric Flair booked him in a match against that big spoon tonight on Nitro and the world title will be on the line, and Hogan replies by saying he owes his fans one last retirement match. Hogan's gonna quit wrestling while holding the world title, and after all the huffing and puffing the Wolfpack's been doing recently, it's gonna be Hogan who gets called the big bad wolf tonight at the end of Nitro. Understatement of the year right there, big man. It's official then, tonight we've got Hollywood Hogan getting a shot at the World Heavyweight Championship. Next up on Raw, we've got that Triple H vs Mankind match for a spot in the Royal Rumble. On Nitro, it's Scotty Steiner vs Conan. So Mankind's been denied the chance at wrestling for the WWF title again, so it's imperative that he wins this match to qualify for the Royal Rumble. Referee My Son Shane shoots Mick a big old smile before Foley and Triple H go at it in the middle of the ring. Mankind takes the advantage early on with a number of right hands and he begins driving Hunter's arm repeatedly into his shoulder. Hunter soon puts a stop to that with some right hands of his own before going to work on Mankind's arm, repaying the favour with the exact same move. Foley's able to make it to his feet before throwing Triple H into the turnbuckle, and Mick then connects with a bulldog. The momentum swings once again as Triple H counters Foley with a back elbow before dropping him with a clothesline. Hunter gets knocked to the outside however, and Mick hits a baseball slide that sends Trips into the barricade. Shane then gets in Mick's face and he tells him to stay in the ring, this allows Helmsley to deliver a shoulder to the midsection from the apron. Hunter then comes back in with a top rope sunset flip, and this is where our match ends folks. Mick grabs the ropes to prevent himself from being pinned, but Shane kicks Foley's hands. This leads to Triple H getting the roll up, and Shane immediately drops to the mat to quickly count to three. Mankind has, once again, been screwed over by the corporation. Shane makes the DX sign while applauding to Triple H. The leader of D-Generation X grabs a mic and he says he's sorry how things turned out but business is business and Hunter will do what he needs to do to become WWF Champion. Despite this, he does wish Mick a happy new year before kicking Shane in the gut and hitting McMahon Jr with a pedigree. He then tells Mankind that Shane's all his, so Foley's gonna take advantage of this generous offer. Mick puts Shane in a submission hold and he threatens to break his shoulder. This is enough to bring Vince and the Stooges down to the ring, and Mick says that he's changed his mind, he doesn't want a title shot at the Royal Rumble after all. Instead, he wants a title shot tonight on Raw's War. Vince says Mick's got his match, but Mrs. Foley's baby boy isn't done yet. He wants to make it a no disqualification match. Vince reluctantly agrees, Mankind lets go of Shane. So here we go, tonight in the Raw main event, we've got The Rock vs Mankind for the WWF Championship. As Hogan walks back up the rampway and before Scott Steiner has his match against Conan, Tony Schiavone makes this announcement on commentary. You're even thinking about changing the channel to our competition fans, do not. Because we understand that Mick Foley, who wrestled here one time as, as Cactus Jack, is going to win their world title. Ugh, he's going to put some butts in the seat. <laughs> What the fans do when they hear this announcement? You don't need to be a genius to work it out. During the commercial break that followed, nearly half a million viewers switched over to the USA Network, and what's more, WCW was on track to beating Raw in the ratings on this night before the announcement was made. As always, Nitro still has 5 minutes of airtime once Raw goes off the air later on, so a large portion of the Raw audience also switch back to TNT to see the final moments of the Nitro main event, and what the wrestling world witnessed was an absolute disaster unfold inside the Georgia Dome. Take the ratings out of the conversation for a moment too and think about how Eric Bischoff, not Tony Schiavone who was just following orders, but how Eric Bischoff tried to steal that surprise moment away from Mick Foley. The ending of Raw is so special when you don't know what's going to happen, and Eric tried his best to ruin it so folks would stay on TNT. Well, this master plan ends up backfiring big time and Eric ends up putting more eyeballs on Mankind's big title win later tonight.
Scotty Steiner set to defend his newly acquired world TV title in this one as he makes his way down to the ring, accompanied by his BFF Buff Bagwell. Steiner grabs the microphone and he says if there's any ladies in need of some extreme romancing, then Big Papa Pump's more than happy to oblige. What a kind and helpful fellow. Buff then, for some reason, decides he wants to show off his boogieing skills as he does a little dance during Scott's promo. Honestly, I had no idea what this was all about, so I actually ended up going down a rabbit hole to find out. It's a touchdown celebration from Jamal Anderson, who played for the Atlanta Falcons at the time. Fascinating stuff, I'm sure you'd all agree. Following this little jig, Buff grabs his chest and he drops the one knee, claiming that he's just getting over triple bypass surgery. So it seems that the Falcons head coach at the time, Dan Reeves, had underwent surgery a few days prior and Buff's making fun of that pretty serious incident. Buff, I have enough to do on Reliving the War every week, the last thing I need is you making obscure references about a sport that I don't care about from over 25 years ago. Stop it. Please, stop it. Anyway, former TV champ Conan comes down to the ring and now we can get on with the actual serious and important sport of professional wrestling. Buff and Scott try to double team K-Dog at the opening bell but Conan fights them off and he takes control with a number of right hands in the corner. A clothesline then sends Big Papa Pump to the floor and it's at this point where Tony once again mentions that over on Raw Mick Foley's gonna win the world belt. This time he laughs after making the comment. That's gonna be their world kick. Back inside the ring, Steiner connects with the clothesline before flexing and dropping his elbow across the back of Conan. He then distracts the referee and this allows Buff to choke K-Dog across the bottom rope. Scotty then places Conan on the top rope, positioning him for a belly to belly suplex, but Conan fights out and he scores with a dodgy Tornado DDT. Conan looks to hit his rolling lariat, Scotty ducks it, but Big Papa Pump still gets caught out with a kick to the midsection and Conan hits the K-Factor. A little miscommunication perhaps because this one looked more than a bit rough. Conan looks to finish things off with a tequila sunrise, but before he can get the hold on, Buff comes in holding the TV title. Conan gets in a few shots, but the referee calls for the bell and this one ends via DQ. Yeah, Conan wins, but he doesn't get the belt back. Both Buff and Scott attack K-Dog after the bout, culminating in K-Dog getting locked in the recliner as Slick Johnson tells the timekeeper to ring the bell, which by the way he was already doing to an infuriating degree. This wasn't enough as the big bad booty daddy grabs a chair to land a few shots across Conan's back. Nitro then goes to a commercial break and, you know, I at least thought we would get a decisive winner in this one, but no. It may be a new year, but it's business as usual on WCW Nitro. Next up on Raw, it's D'Lo vs Edge. On Nitro, Wrath issues an open challenge. Sounds interesting. D'Lo takes control early on with a side headlock and a shoulder tackle, but he falls victim to a drop kick followed by a head scissor takedown. He then finds himself on the outside after taking a clothesline. As D'Lo looks to gain his bearings, he's met by Edge who comes flying over the top rope. Proof that vampires, sorry, those who lead a gothic lifestyle, can indeed fly. To be fair though, it always impressed me when Edge hit this dive without even touching the ropes. Edge flies once again, except this time it's into the barricade. Dalo rolls his opponent back inside so he can hit his signature leg drop. The former European champ delivers a pair of hard chops to Edge in the corner, and I bet Edge wished he invested in a chest protector, right? Edge does try to fight back as he throws Dalo into the opposite corner, but he gets caught out with a boot to the face before getting dropped with a running power bomb. This looked great, and Dalo's rightly miffed that the crowd aren't giving him the adulation he deserves. He keeps Edge on the mat with a body slam, but Dilo misses his follow up elbow drop from the middle rope. Edge takes advantage with a spinning wheel kick before heading up top. He connects with a big crossbody for a two, so our match continues on. PMS makes an appearance and Michael Cole says it must be that time of the month. We have got a joker on our hands here folks. Terry holds onto her stomach on her way to the ring, giving everyone a visual reminder that she's still pregnant, apparently. But the camera quickly cuts back to the ring just in time to see Dilo counter Edge's top rope attack and do a sky high. This looked absolutely brilliant. This, my friends, is where the brilliance ends though because of what happens next. Dilo notices the ladies are at ringside and he tells them to leave. He steps through the ring ropes to confront Terry, who slips off the ring steps and Terry tumbles to the floor. The referee and Jackie immediately call for help as a deeply concerned Dilo looks on. Medical personnel make their way down to the ring to place a distraught Terry on a stretcher before wheeling her back up the ramp. 
She's screaming in pain and she can be heard asking if her baby's alright. I don't think I need to tell you how tasteless and downright disgusting this whole idea was. It's a storyline that had zero redeeming qualities. The whole thing was the brainchild of Vince Russo and as you'd fully expect, Terry absolutely hated it. She begged to have the angle scrapped, she had a young daughter of her own and she really didn't want little Dakota seeing all this on TV. This angle's only saving grace is the fact that it's overshadowed by so many other things that happened on Raw this night, but that doesn't excuse it being put on TV in the first place. You'll hear folks say time and time again that Vince Russo failed in WCW because he didn't have Vince McMahon as a filter. Well, Vince McMahon did a fine job filtering this bullshit on his TV show. Raph looks to continue his second winning streak on Nitro. He grabs a microphone for a rare promo, this is something I've wanted to see for months now, and he says that he's had no problem plowing through everybody in WCW over these past six months, except for Kevin Nash there, big man, but we don't need to discuss that at the moment. Raph also says he's getting tired of the lack of competition, so he issues an open challenge to anyone in the back, and oh boy, here comes Bam Bam Bigelow to accept this kind invitation. Raph's mic work wasn't awful here either by the way, he wasn't terrible by any means. So we're in for a big beefy boy battle here tonight ladies and gentlemen on Nitro. Both men attempt to knock each other down with shoulder blocks but neither man's gonna budge. Raph tries a different tactic and it proves to be successful, knocking Bigelow down with a couple of running clotheslines, but he gets a bit too overconfident as Bam Bam ducks to the third clothesline and Raph spills out of the floor. Bigelow follows him to the outside and the two exchange shots until Raph gets his head bounced off the ring post. Bigelow keeps the advantage back inside the ring with some hard shots before driving his head into Raph's uh, little nuclear plants, his little nuclear reactor, his atom bombs, I don't know. It goes to the outside again, Raph gets up close and personal with both the guardrail and the ring apron before laying in a few chops. The two continue to brawl on the outside for a few minutes before Bam Bam slides a chair into the ring and man I sure do hope this one doesn't end in DQ. Bigelow sets Raph up for a move onto said chair but the referee intervenes. This little distraction allows Raph to counter with a backdrop before delivering a clothesline that sends both men out to the floor yet again. Bam Bam looks to smash Raph in the face with the chair but the big man's able to avoid the contact at the very last second and the two fight up on the entranceway. The match then gets thrown out, we hear the bell ring and I'm gonna change this show's name to reliving the disqualifications. This match wasn't good at all, if WCW want to build up Bigelow into some sort of threat then getting a win over a near undefeated Raph may have gone some way to achieving that goal, but no, no contests and DQs for all. Kane scheduled for a 2 on 1 match next on Raw. On Nitro we see the conclusion of Miss Elizabeth's questioning. Looks like Kane got an updated Briscoe's body shop sign stuck to his back, the last one was a bit hard to see on TV. Shane McMahon's gonna referee this match it seems and Shane also introduces Kane's opponents. It's none other than Pat Patterson and Jerry Briscoe. Vince McMahon appears and he reminds his stooges that everyone has to pay for what happened to Shane a few weeks back and seeing as Patterson and Briscoe were no help at all when the boy wonder got attacked, well they have to get taught a hard lesson tonight from the big red machine. The stooges try to pay Kane off, Patterson even offers Kane a cigarette and for some reason a rubber johnny. Yes, Patterson was offering Kane a ride it seems, but Kane has absolutely no interest. Briscoe gets chokeslammed while Patterson grabs a chair, Shane warns Kane that Pat's trying a sneak attack, so the stooge sets the chair up to give Kane a nice comfortable seat but once again Kane has no interest. Patterson gets chokeslammed too, Briscoe gets his corporate nuts smashed on the ring post and Kane then loses it and he goes after Shane O'Mac. Luckily for Shane, his dad reminds the big red machine that he'll get sent back to the insane asylum if he does anything to the boy wonder. So Kane lets go and Mr McMahon announces that Kane's the winner of this match. On the rampway, Shane gives his dad a big hug, a very touching moment for sure, but what's not so touching is Dennis Knight still hanging around in this weird torture room. This time though, the acolytes show up to take Dennis away, and Farouk says, it's time, he's ready for you. On Nitro, the constant questions have gotten to Miss Elizabeth. 
Casey closed and Drew Peacock have managed to break the first lady of wrestling and now she's changing her answers. Casey says all the wrestlers stay at the same hotel while Peacock informs Liz that Goldberg owns that gym she mentioned earlier on, so Liz gives it up. She's looking at possible jail time for telling Porky Pies, so she says she must have been mistaken. It wasn't actually Goldberg, all these bald headed wrestlers look the same you know, so what can you do? Liz tells the boys to apologise to Bill on her behalf, saying as he's probably gonna miss his title show tonight. Tony Schiavone still hopeful that Goldberg can make it back to the arena on time, but I'm not so sure about that. We have reached our semi-main events, Road Dogg vs Al Snow on Raw for the hardcore title and on Nitro it's Brian Adams vs Diamond Dallas Page. The hardcore champion gets distracted by this gruesome version of head that Al planted on the entranceway, and this allows Al to attack Road Dog from behind. No Bret Hart shut up clip this week I'm afraid, but thank god, I'm running out of ideas. Shut up! Al puts the boots to Rody before the two brawl down to the ring, with Al getting his actual head bounced off the ring steps. Mr. Dog goes in search of some weapons under the ring, Al looks to dive at the champ off the apron, but he gets stopped in mid-air via steel chair to the face. Al's able to shrug it off and he returns the favour by cracking the same chair over the back of the roadie. Al then sets the chair up as the champ's against the barricade and Al delivers a leg lariat that sends Road Dog into the front row. The challenger then sets up a table before giving the champ another shot with the chair. Road Dog gets placed on that table and Al attempts a moonsault off the barricade, but James gets out of the way and it's Al who goes crashing through the wood. Roadie then grabs a bacon tray and he bops Al over the head a few times, much to Al's delight it would seem, but the third shot finally drops our slightly unhinged friend. The two then continue to fight up the side of the entrance ramp where Road Dog sets up another table and it's Al who once again gets put through it. Rody launches himself off some steps at the side of the stage and he connects with a double axe handle, but this just seems to motivate Mr. Snow as he pummels Road Dog, eventually leading the two into the janitor's area backstage. Road Dog gets choked with a hose and then smacked with a box of toilet paper before having a broom broken over his back. Pretty sure the janitor needed that owl, so you better replace it by the end of the night. Al then, in a rather unusual move, launches a potted plant at the road dog and it catches him right in the face. I think we finally got to the root of why road dog talks so much gibberish. Perhaps he'll leaf all of the silly wordplay in the past. It's time he got a new shtick anyway. Last one, I promise. Road Dog fights back and he sends Al into a stack of conveniently placed kegs. I bet Al wishes he was anywhere but beer right now. Right, okay, I'm done. The fight eventually ends up outside the arena onto the snowy streets of Worcester Mass. You'd think fighting in the snow would give Mr. Snow an advantage. However, you'd be sorely mistaken as Road Dog delivers a pile driver to Al on a wooden pallet, which gets him the pin and the win. Road Dog retains his title in what was a pretty entertaining hardcore match on Monday Night Raw, no complaints about this one. After the match, we see the acolytes bringing Dennis Knight into a smoke filled room and guys, I've worked it out, there's only one guy who creates this much smoke in the world of pro wrestling, Dennis Knight is being initiated into the One Warrior Nation. Over on Nitro, the fans in the Georgia Dome are pretty jacked up to see DDP here tonight as he makes his way to the ring through the crowd. Page overwhelms Adams with quick offense before Brand tries to make peace. The biker Michael Liger extends his hand, but he then says psych and he slaps Page in the face. How could he do such a thing? Brand gets in a few shots, but Page is able to quickly turn things around and he forces Adams to retreat to the outside to talk strategy with Vincent. If you want to strategically plan out your next move, Vincent is definitely the man to talk to. Page looks for a plancha to the outside, but Adams and Vincent unwittingly keep moving around, leading to Page having to stop himself on two or three occasions. This seems to be a genuine mistake on the part of the NWO lads, so Page just decides to dive over the ropes anyway to complete the spot. Vincent grabs Page as he's making his way back into the ring, allowing Adams to get in a cheap shot and take control of the match. A right hand sends DDP back outside for Vincent to get in a few strikes, and Dallas gets in only for Adams to choke him with his big boot as Nitro goes the commercial break. We come back to see Page fight out of a side headlock and he knocks Adams down with a clothesline before delivering a swinging neckbreaker. Adams counters a diamond cutter attempt and he's able to score with a low blow as Page was on the second rope. He then hits his wonky pile driver but it only gets him a two, as it should. Adams stays in control with a thumb to the eye before applying a big grizzly bear hug. DDP fights out but he's sent back down to the mat following a tilt-a-word backbreaker from Big Brian. 
Paige gets sent into the ropes, but he's able to counter Adam's hip toss attempt with a DDT before both men get back to their feet. Dallas then hits his discus lariat. As is tradition, Vincent looks to interfere and it doesn't work out too well, and Paige wins the match after hitting a diamond cutter off the second rope. Not the best looking diamond cutter you'll ever see, but it led to a clean finish, so I'll take it. Another subpar contest on Nitro, but there is a positive here, and that positive is the fan still firmly being behind Diamond Dallas Page and everything he does. On Raw, Shawn Michaels has to pop out for a moment and he asks Triple H for the keys to his rental car. Triple H hands the keys over, Shawn gives Hunter a big hug and he says he'll be back soon, but when the door closes, Hunter says maybe, maybe not, and X-Pac says what goes around comes around. HBK tries to open the car door but the key doesn't fit, and just as he's about to head back into the arena, he gets jumped. Footage recorded during a commercial break shows us that Sean was attacked by the corporation, and it looks like DX knew this was gonna happen. D-Generation X aren't friends with the corporation, but they aren't friends with HBK either it seems. So once again, Shawn Michaels has left the building. Meanwhile, over on Nitro, Bill Goldberg finds out that Elizabeth dropped the charges and she admitted she was lying. He stands up, he tells Dirty Copper to take the handcuffs off, and he orders the 5-0 to take him to the dome post haste. Take me to the dome. Let's go. Raw ends with The Rock defending his WWF title against Mankind. On Nitro, Kevin Nash defends the world title against Hollywood Hulk Hogan. Many, many fans knew what was going to happen on Raw tonight, but those same fans still tuned in to see how things would unfold. DX are going to provide backup tonight for Mick Foley while the corporation come down to ringside with Rocky. The corporate champ attacks early on when Mick's distracted by McMahon and company at ringside, and the match quickly goes to the outside where Rock tells his teammates to back off. The Rock's got this. It takes no time at all for Mick to turn things around and Rock gets punished at the commentary table and barrier. Mick's feeling pretty confident right now, but the champ comes back when he throws Foley into the ring steps. Mr. McMahon watches on as Rocky drops the ring steps across Foley's back, Mick's head ends up getting stuck and Rock uses the other half of the steps to do even more damage. Absolutely no messing around here folks. After suplexing Mick, the Rock goes on commentary and he says he just checked Mankind into the Smackdown Hotel. He then goes to spit water over his opponent, but Foley punches the corporate champ in the face, and after Rock gets taken out, Mick puts the headset on and he says he's showing a lot of testicular fortitude. Yes Mick, you definitely are. But watch out because here comes Rock with the ring bell. Things go from bad to worse for Mick. The Rock chokes him out with some cord, the Great One sets Mankind up on the announce table, and Mick then takes a rock bottom. Even McMahon thought this one was quite nasty. Once both men recuperate, the match finally gets back in the ring and it's Rock who takes control. The corporation then show they aren't afraid to get involved when Shane begins choking Mick on the bottom rope, and as Rock hits a Russian leg sweep, Jerry Lawler takes a shot at WCW when he says this isn't one of those main events that takes place two minutes before the show goes off the air. Mick's able to take Rock down with a jumping clothesline, but the corporate champ body slams the challenger in the middle of the ring. Rock hits the corporate elbow while making fun of Mr. Socko, but Foley kicks out and the crowd have become completely unglued. Mick gets up, the Rock gets hit with a swinging neckbreaker, the big boss man then distracts Mick and Tess slides the WWF Championship belt into the ring. Rock picks it up, Foley gets clocked, and just when you think it's all over, Mick shows a lot of heart by kicking out. Rock swings again, but he ends up taking a double arm DDT on the belt. Rock kicks out at two, so it's time for Rocky to take the mandible claw. Ken Shamrock comes in with a chair shot to Foley, but Billy Gunn says not today Kenny boy, and Shamrock gets wiped out. As the corporation and DX begin to brawl on the outside, the stone cold surprise appears and the pop's incredible. Austin gets in the ring, he hits Rock with a chair to the head, he pulls Mick over the champ, and Mick Foley becomes the WWF Champion on Raw's War. All that sympathy fans felt for Mick, all those times Mick got screwed over. It all comes full circle right here, and it's one of the most amazing feel-good moments in the whole history of Monday Night Raw. Vince can't believe it, the corporation are in shock, Stone Cold's got a smirk on his face, and Mick Foley's just filled with joy. Michael Cole makes a great call when he says Mick Foley's achieved his dream and the dream of everyone else who's been told you can't do it. It's just a brilliant ending to a roller coaster episode of Raw. 
Road Dog announces that Mick Foley is the new WWF champion as McMahon seethes on the entranceway. Mick tells Vince that this feels pretty damn good, and he dedicates his win to his two little children sitting at home. He says daddy did it before taking a victory lap around the ring, and yeah, if I had the opportunity, Mick Foley would have definitely put my butt in a seat after seeing this Raw main event. Fans who watched the ending of Raw had the opportunity to switch over to Nitro to see what went down in the Nash vs Hogan main event. WCW ran overtime as usual, so a lot of people left the USA Network feeling very happy and fulfilled by what they just witnessed in the Mankind vs Rock main event. Hogan comes down to the ring with NWO black and white leader Scotty Stanner but Nash has brought some backup of his own. Scott Hall's here and he's wearing a Wolfpack shirt. The bad guy is officially part of the faction and this should have been the first red flag after what Hall and Nash said about each other last week. The crowd pop huge for Scott Hall though, and yes, Hall and Nash being together once again is awesome. They never should have broken up in the first place though. Hogan tells Stanner to watch his back before stepping into the ring. Nash makes fun of Hogan by ripping off his shirt. Hogan circles around the ring and he takes a moment to listen to the fans, and then Kevin shoves Hulk. They're building this up pretty nicely, all things considered. Hogan then cocks his fist back but he doesn't punch Nash, instead he pokes him with one finger and Kevin takes a bump. Hogan then covers Kevin, he wins the match via pinfall, and Hollywood Hogan is the new WCW World Heavyweight Champion. Maybe 5 or 10% of the audience react to what happens while the others look on in bewilderment, but it then makes sense when Wolfpack members and NW Hollywood members begin celebrating together. Nash lay down for Hulk, there's no divide anymore between the Wolfpack and the black and white, and it would seem we now have a reunited New World Order. Goldberg arrives on the scene, he rushes to the ring, he takes out Steiner and Hall, and when Hogan attacks him with the world belt, Goldberg no sells it. The world champ takes a spear, and the crowd make a lot of noise. Lex Luger then shows up, we think he's going to help fight off these NWO dirtbags, but Lex saves Hogan from getting jackhammered, and Goldberg gets put in the torture rack. To be fair, this is probably the most interesting thing Lex Luger's done all year. Goldberg gets handcuffed to the ropes, he gets tasered by Scott Hall, Hulk Hogan uses red spray paint to spray Goldberg's back and the World Heavyweight Championship, and there you have it, the incident known as the Finger Poke of Doom. Now remember what we just watched on Raw, and look at this, there is absolutely no defending it, and somehow, someway, WCW take another colossal misstep by pretty much screwing over their fan base, both those who paid money to get into the Georgia Dome and those who took time to check out this main event on TV. Also, I need to say this, this wasn't the end for WCW, I know many people like to say that, but it wasn't. WCW's TV ratings stay within the same range throughout all of January, so it wasn't this big event that killed off an entire organisation, but it definitely hurt the minimal goodwill that loyal fans had in the company and the company's ability to deliver on what they promised. You've been watching this series with me, you know WCW's been declining long before the finger poke of doom while WWF's been flying high, but we could look at this Nash vs Hogan match as the beginning of a new chapter for WCW, a long and very drawn out chapter that turns out to be the last in a book that started off pretty well. Is it still fun to look back on today? Absolutely. Does its overall effect on WCW get blown out of proportion? Yes, yes it does. But from a fan's perspective who watched Nitro at the time, it was another bad NWO ending that didn't do any good for anyone involved. I was tempted to call this one a tie, and I always envisioned this episode being a tie because of how both Raw and Nitro were so intertwined. You really can't watch one without watching the other. But after watching Mankind vs Rock again and how WWF built up to that match, I have to give it to Raw this week. When all said and done, the WWF put on one of their most memorable main events while WCW put on a match that would cause them a great deal of ridicule as time went on. I will say this though, if you're planning on your own rewatch, make sure you watch both shows. The 25th anniversary is coming up soon and you'll see lots of clips of the finger poke everywhere. Do yourself a favour and get the full context for both shows and you'll get way more out of Mankind's title win. Raw now has 82 points, Nitro's on 67 and we've got 18 ties on the board. 
In the TV ratings, Raw scored a 5.7, while Nitro scored a 5. Had Tony Schiavone not announced that Mick Foley was going to win the belt, then those numbers would have looked very different. Next week on Nitro, we'll hear from this reunited NWO and hopefully we'll find out why they got back together in the first place. Ric Flair takes on Kurt Hennig, and speaking of the Nature Boy, Eric Bischoff's got himself some new duties courtesy of Slick Rick. On Raw, things get a little dark when the Acolytes bring Dennis Knight to the arena, the WWF take shots at a certain WCW main eventer, and not only will we hear from Mankind, but we'll also see the new WWF champion in action. Thanks for watching this one guys, I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you all next week for another episode of Reliving the War. Take care.